one's birth earlier. How then should I understand that you taught this in the beginning? An interesting construction of this verse is that Arjuna addresses Krishna as Bhavataha and Tvam. It's like in the same sentence you're speaking to someone and you say Aap and Tum in the same sentence. You'll never do that. If you say Tum, you'll continue in that. If you say Aap, you'll continue saying that. But why is he using two words? Why is he saying Bhavataha and Tvam? Because Krishna has said in the earlier verse, I am teaching this to you because you are my disciple and my friend. So as a disciple, he addresses him as Bhavataha with respect. As a friend, he uses the more familiar term. In this, you find that Krishna has ensured that the communication channel is open. You know, we speak, we talk all the time, we try and communicate with people without understanding, without having a pulse on the listener. So it's like you are speaking Russian and the listener is understanding Chinese. There is no communication. Similarly, we keep talking and you find that the listener has wandered off somewhere else. He's not even looking at you. Krishna is an ace communicator. He understands exactly how to get the listener focused, concentrated on what he's saying. Throughout the Gita, you'll find at the correct moment, just when he feels Arjuna is about to doze, he he comes up with something that makes him alert and sit up and take notice. So, now what's happened is Arjuna and Krishna are dear friends. In the context of the Mahabharata, somewhere deep down, somewhere in the background, Arjuna understands that Krishna is at a much higher level than he is. But he still doesn't know the, the full import, the full glory and magnificence of Krishna's stature. So he understands Krishna only as an individual. He un doesn't understand him in his um, divine form. And therefore it is in the 11th chapter when somewhere deep down he suspects that Krishna has a personality that is way beyond his understanding, he asks him for his divine form. As of now, he looks at him as an individual personality. So therefore, he has misunderstood the whole, the last few verses, three verses, he's completely misunderstood. And this is what all spiritual seekers misunderstand. So when the Guru speaks, as we've said earlier, it is not the personality that is speaking, it is Atman that is speaking. Atman is only using the person as a vehicle to transmit that knowledge. So when you look at a teacher or a teaching, you mustn't look at the knowledge that is coming out of an individual personality, you must consider the teachings. And you'll be a good student if you are able to separate the teacher from the teachings. Why? There is a possibility if the teacher is wrong and you are looking, you are following only the personality, you will be completely misled. Even if the teacher is right, you won't understand because he is talking from a high pedestal, he is talking from a higher level and that higher level is not accessible to you. What will you see? You will see only as far as your eyes can see, uh, eyes in the sense, your vision, your, uh, your knowledge can go. And therefore your perspective of the Guru is, oh, he wakes up at four o'clock in the morning, he eats so little, he... Um, Recently, uh, in um, Rishikesh, there was a person who was, a question was asked by somebody to um, Swami, 
uh, how did you get into it? And he said, oh, I went through great rigors. So when you see his life, you believe that you have to go through what he went through. You have to live the life he has led to gain the knowledge. It's not so. Every individual is distinct and different. So the actions that you have to do, the lifestyle that you have to follow may be completely different from your Guru's. But what you have to hang on to is the teachings. It's the teachings that will take you to his, to his vision, to that perspective, to that higher level from which he sees things differently. See, it's like this. If you look at the interaction between a child of five years old and his parents, the child's view of the parent is completely different because he has no access to the joys that the parent uh, has, uh, has, uh, is enjoying. So he looks at the father, says every morning he goes to work, every morning he sits at a desk in front, maybe in front of a computer, all so many hours, boring, he sits there and comes back. What? So he's the in the child's view, adulthood is a terribly boring existence because there are no toys, there are no games, there is no fun and frolic, there is no running around, there is no mischief. So to him, adulthood is boring. Similarly, when you and I look at a person of spiritual enlightenment, we think it is boring because that person is not doing all the things that we are doing. That doesn't mean his life is boring. That doesn't mean spiritual life is boring. What it means is that we do not have access to the bliss, the excitement, the invigorating energy that he is enjoying. But because we have no access to that, uh, we are not enthused to follow in his footsteps. And then we look at a completely distorted version because we look at the life. There are students who follow not just the lifestyle of the Guru, the clothing of the Guru, the manner in which the Guru speaks, the manner, everything they copy. But the main thing they don't get, which is the teachings. So, as they say, it takes one to see one. You need to be at that level to understand what goes on in the mind of the person. It's like, you know, if you look at uh, Einstein, Apparently, Einstein had four identical suits in his wardrobe. Why did he have that? Because when he opened his wardrobe, he did not want to expend or waste unnecessary energy in thinking about what to wear. You and I, and you open your cupboard, you know, there are people who open they wear something, they say, no, I don't think, you take it off, wear something else. So the room looks like a hurricane has been through it by the time they get dressed and go. So, and it takes a lot of time. Now, if you want to be a physicist of Einstein's caliber, and you decide to have four identical suits in your wardrobe, are you going to become the physicist? No. That's the point. So, what he's saying is, at any period of time, anywhere in the world, whatever be the lifestyle of the person, as long as the person has uncovered his self and reached that state of enlightenment, has gained access to Atman, whatever manner he may speak in, whatever manner he may communicate, whether he communicates or does not, meaning whether he speaks or does not speak, Atman will communicate itself. And therefore it is, that you have had people of realization of different calibers. You had a Ramana Maharshi who did not speak at all, who did not move outside of his home anywhere. And yet he inspired people from across the globe, from 10,000 miles away who came all the way to where he was, not to hear him, just to experience that Atman. There was a Swami Ramatirtha who went lecturing all over the world, brilliant speeches that he gave. He also communicated Atman. There was a Tyagaraja who sang 
Mirabai who sang. There were so many people who just through the music inspired people and communicated that Atman. And so what he's saying is, he's not saying that I, Krishna, many thousands of years ago gave it to Vivaswan. What he meant is, whoever gave the knowledge to Vivaswan was Atman. And when Krishna says I, he means Atman. When you and I say I, we can mean a whole lot of things. Just now at, at the end of this, at eight o'clock, if you say, are you coming with me? What are you referring to? The body. When there has been a bereavement in your, um, in your family, somebody who lives very far away, maybe in New York, has lost a near and dear one. It's not possible for you to go to New York. You make a telephone call to the person and say, don't worry, I'm with you. What do you mean? What are you referring to? Emotions. Emotionally, you're lending support to the person and saying, I'm with you, meaning the mind is with you. In a university, when a professor is teaching and he finds the, you know, very often the student gets a glazed look in his eyes. Um, a few people here also have that. A glazed look in the eyes means he's gone off, he's not, he's not understood. So the professor wants to wake him up and say, Are you with me? You, the student can't say, Look, unfortunately I am with you. What, he's not referring to the body, the physically is there before him. He's talking about his intellect. Are you following my line of thinking? Is what the professor is saying. Now, here is a person, Krishna, who has completely identified with Atman. The body, mind, intellect are there for us to see. As far as he's concerned, there is no body, mind and intellect. He's gone way above it and identified with the Atman. Therefore it is, you know, there's a story in the Bhagavat Purana which is so beautiful. They say, when Krishna was born, Devaki and his parents were enthralled with the fact that Atman, you know, uh, is present before them. And then they say that the baby started crying, which means the Atman identified with Prakriti, with matter, and then became like any other infant child. So this is it. In the world there is matter, there is body, there is mind, there is intellect that we are all interacting with. But in and through that it's as if Atman is playing hide and seek with us. It gives a flash here, it gives a, another flash there, it gives a um, glimpse here and it gives another glimpse there. But we miss it because we are so obsessed with physical, emotional and intellectual things. So it's not as if the brilliance of Atman is not present. It's just that we, have, we don't have the eyes to see. And when you develop the eyes to see, you see this brilliant splash of divinity everywhere. And then you understand that what you're seeing, the divinity that you're seeing outside, is actually inside. This recognition of the fact that it is within you and you identify with it. Then when a person like that says, I, it means Atman. Because as far as he is concerned, there is nothing else. Krishna was like this from birth itself. And therefore when he says I, he cannot mean body, mind and intellect. Unfortun so also all the spiritual masters, when they say, said come to me or follow me, they did not mean their individual personalities, they meant Atman. And you and I have completely misunderstood that. The followers misunderstood it because they had no capacity to go beyond the body, mind, intellect. And therefore it is that in the name of religion, the people who are following the same God, the same divine spa, are fighting with each other. Because one says, my guru said this, the other says, my guru said, said this, my master said this, my master said that, my prophet said this, my pro your prophet said that. And this is the state of the world today. Anyway, verse 5. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Bahu Nime Vyati Tani 
जन्मानि तवचार्जुन तान्यहं वेद सर्वाणी नत्वं वेथ परंतपा The blessed Lord said You and I have passed through many births O Arjuna I know them all You do not know O Parantapa scorcher of falls So in this verse he is referring to the theory of reincarnation the concept that you and I go through many many births and this incarnation this passage through many births is driven by desires so what he is saying here is that you and I like Arjuna are stuck to this present birth we have no knowledge of the past we have no knowledge of the future it's like this and from this limited perspective so our knowledge is severely limited severely constricted from this limited knowledge whatever we do must necessarily be incorrect wrong we have no idea that we have gone through so many births in the past and in the future also we'll go through so many more births you get stuck to one stuck attached to one our own little world and we're not able to break free from it so he you see even in modern life in management they say if you want to arrive at a solution to a problem you have to rise above that problem as long as you're stuck at the same level you will never arrive at a solution now you go back to the problems that you have faced and see how it works you have a certain problem until such time as you don't rise above the problem the solution will never occur to you take the example of east and west germany they were bitter enemies bitter foes they considered each other as enemies when they were one at some point in time they rose above it they rose above that berlin wall and they saw possibility of living in unison living in unity which was a far better option than sitting there with the problem and this is the problem with all of us all conflicts arise because of inability to rise above that little way of looking at it the moment you rise above it you see there is no problem at all the problem itself dissolves by itself so that's exactly what he's saying says you have no concept when he says past and future it it's not necessarily that you have to accommodate the uh, the idea of reincarnation even the past as in the three states right now you're in the waking state in the past maybe you were in the deep sleep state in the future you will be in the dream state these are the three states that we go through but at any given point in time you are stuck in one state you have no awareness of the fact that you are going through three states if you had known that you would develop basic objectivity like it could be that in the dream that you had last night you had a completely different experience as king janaka did king janaka one fine day um woke up from a dream and that dream was a frightening dream he had that he was a beggar begging in the streets and when he woke up he understood he is a king but unlike us he didn't put the pillow over his head again and go back to sleep he woke up and he called all the learned people around him and said i had a dream i dreamt that i was a beggar now what i want to know is is the dream real or is this experience real one of the two has to be real and then his guru the sage ashtavakra appeared on the scene and told him gave him this mind blowing truth and that is neither the beggar is reality nor is the king a reality both are unreal and there is a fourth plane of consciousness 
there is one step beyond the waking state that is real so anyway right now he's not referring to that all krishna is saying is that you and i have gone through many births many experiences i have access to them all you do not arjuna is a limited human being who experiences only his present state he has no access to the past no access to the future and um, one last verse we'll take Ajopi sanna vyayatma bhutana mishvaro pisan prakrutim swamadhishthaya sambhavamyatma mayaya ajaha do unborn of imperishable nature and also lord of all beings governing my own prakriti matter i take birth by my own maya now he is explaining how spirit and matter interact what is the relationship between spirit and matter you and i are a combination of spirit and matter so how did this incredible impossible combination of spirit and matter come into existence is what he is telling us here ajaha unborn i am unborn when he says you see arjuna's question is how did you tell this to vivaswam for which the direct answer he is giving is atman is unborn unborn means therefore no death what does he mean by this the ocean see the waves in the ocean have a birth have an existence and a death but the ocean itself has neither birth nor existence nor death yet the basic substance of the wave and the ocean is the same in fact even when the wave assumes an individuality it is still nothing but ocean it's the same with us you and i have assumed an identity of our own even while we assume an identity and even while we establish that identity the reality is that you are no different from the totality which is atman and therefore when he says though unborn though i am unborn what it means is each one of us is unborn if you say i am unborn it gives you a completely different perspective of life at least temporarily and it is these temporary you see it's like this you are stuck to something temporarily if you lift yourself up it, it, it gives you some relief it gives you a different picture different attitude towards things and then you begin to establish yourself there so though unborn the sun above is one that sun is unborn but wherever there is a reflecting medium on earth a reflected sun comes into being that reflected sun has a birth has an existence has a death wherever there is a mirror the sun will be reflected when you smash the mirror what happens if your attention is on the reflected sun you'll go into morning and say oh the reflected sun has died but if your attention is on the original sun even when the mirror is smashed and the reflected sun is dead the truth is nothing has happened the sun remains in its immaculate state and if you and i want to get freedom from the problems the stresses the challenges of life a very powerful method to get there is at least temporarily when things happen and you get affected you tell yourself i am that unborn imperishable atman what how can this affect temporary relief it gets you when you are going through severe physical pain god forbid tell yourself it's the body that is feeling the pain 
I'm not feeling the pain and you experience this relief. Otherwise you get completely overwhelmed by experiences, completely overwhelmed by the pain. You know, at least a child suffers only when it is experiencing the pain. But you and I suffer in anticipation of the pain and suffer thinking back to the pain. Even when you are free of the pain, the thought of the pain that you had experienced in the past is enough to keep the suffering going. So, at least that will stop. Then he said,